Public notice of this meeting is for the pursuant to the open public meeting act has been given by the secretary in the following manner. Posted on the bulletin board at the bar clerk's office and mailed to the retrospect newspaper. Uh, newspaper dedicated by the borough for that purpose. I'd like to have all, all please. Here. 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 Mr. Fartemir sat in our last meeting. Mr. Kelstorga was appointed as solicitor to the planning board, but because he's the prosecutor, there's a law that says he cannot sit and handle both positions. So we had to go out for bids for a solicitor. Uh, I was here at two o'clock last Friday. We opened the bids. There were three respondents. One respondent was the gentleman that's present this evening, Mr. David Cartemir of Cartemir and Rowan, attorneys of law. The other was a, an outfit from, uh, it's L&M Associates from Euclid Street in Woodbury, New Jersey. And the other was a Eric M. Bernstein from Warren, New Jersey, which is pretty far up north. In reviewing the applications and of the respondents, uh, I was sat in a meeting with our chief financial officer, Richard Wright, and there was a couple of concerns I had. We discussed them. I just want to let you know that Mr. Cartermere's office, uh, is, we asked for professional legal services certification, the response time, can they do the same day response? to a more licensed attorneys, evidence to their qualifications, which of course is there. The names and rates are dual perform the, for the borough run of the, if there's some, some people respond to that seven or eight lawyers. And I don't know whether they will charge different rates or not. The references and the record of successes were satisfied by all applicants, the timely performance, the hourly rates of each individual, in Mr. Cartermere's case, that will be the same. Resumes, uh, list the types of public clients and people from uh, North Jersey, all their applicants are from North Jersey, and they, they were pretty well represented up there. And as similar services to other public clients, that was one of the things. The main thing that the borough running me was concerned with, and the two other applicants never responded to the, the specifications in the RFP. And I think what happens is you get boilerplate. They take everything that all the, everything that they have on their file and they copy it, and put it in the thing, and send it to you. But Mr. Carter here as well did respond with the clerical and other expenses. They will be, they will be included in the Carter, Muir, and Rowan's hourly rate. So, it would be my recommendation at this time, based on previous knowledge, that uh, Mr. Carter, Muir, and Rowan be appointed uh, to, to be, I put his name in nomination for the attorney for the solicitor, solicitor for the planning board for Carter, Rowan. Mr. Chairman, I'll accept the nomination. I want to cite that uh, in addition to the uh, remarks that you had, um, the, uh, the call proposal um, from the uh, Bernstein uh, outfit uh, cited $60 per hour for uh, paralegals. It's going to be included in Mr. Farmers. Um The Woodbury, New Jersey uh, application, um, their longest tenure of service began in 1997. Um, with Mr. Collier, uh, 1972, and he has much more experience. And uh, one thing that I thought was very important to me that uh, we asked to be specified was that if applications 
that require more than one hearing before the board to be continued. It will be the responsibility of that attorney that appeared at the initial hearing to continue with that application. We have two very large scope applications on our plate right now that are going to come to fruition over the next few months, and they are going to span over multiple meetings. The Lafayette project, which is Cedar, has already spanned. It's going to be a probably phase one, phase two, phase three. And I believe the Samos uh, project is going to be of the same nature, where it's going to span numerous meetings. And um, I am very comfortable. Uh, David's been before us before in different capacities as a professional. And I'm just comfortable knowing that we're going to have the same uh, gentleman with us throughout every phase of that application because it also can bring someone to speed on a complicated uh, site plan in 20 minutes. So that's one of the reasons, uh, one of the many reasons where I want to second the uh, nomination of Mr. Palmer. Motion to make and second. Uh, roll call, please. Dickinson? Yes. Alvarez? Yes. Beatrice? Yes. Lay Yes. Jowski? Yeah. Dunn? Yes. Holberly? Yes. Over? Yes. Well, congratulations. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you very much. I thank the board for giving me the opportunity to uh, represent uh, you as a pastor here at the Charlie Bundy. And I look forward to serving you with my partner and I. We had another conflict uh, tonight, but I didn't realize otherwise my partner would have been here uh, with me this evening also. We received a call to come in in an active capacity again uh, because we had an application coming in that, that we were not aware of. Uh, otherwise, he would have been here with me. Thank you, David. Uh, so, let's for approval of the minutes of the January meeting. I make the motion. Uh, Mr. 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 Chairman, I have a couple questions on it the, as far as the minutes go. Um, I think that we have to have Councilman Woods name stricken from all the votes, as he was not a member of our planning board. Um, there is also no mention of Mr. Schultz questioning whether Councilman White's presence on the plate was to address. And also, as far as the Burma War matter, it was stated in the minutes that there needs to be an ordinance on this. And I believe that there is an ordinance as far as the fence goes. An ordinance on the plate, huh? the, uh, the fence on the corner property. That was the Burma War matter. It says in the minutes that um, there needs to be an ordinance adopted reference to this. Right. There has, to be a, there has to be an ordinance adopted locally. It's not doesn't come under the state. I believe one of you has an ordinance on this. As far as the corner property, they're having two front yards. That's not true. That's not true. Uh, I, I think I believe it's only applicable to the. The new R3 area. The new R3 area has specification in there. That corner, all corner lots will have two front. All corner lots will have two front doors. I don't think it's in any, any of the other uh, R1 or R2 or down where you live or the only R1s. You're, you're in R3, you're in R2, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, most of the towns are one. Now, we, we created the R3 because it would have been an upgrade for the property that was standing vacant. We figured we didn't want to regress back to. Right. Okay. So we figured if we made it R3, it's at least, you know, because some people like to have more vacant than others. Right. And uh, that went to an 80 foot front with a 100 foot then. So, to my recollection, and, and I'm not a I, don't review these things on a daily basis. Okay. But I think the only one that's in is in the R3. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, sure. Other than that, the uh, two points that I mentioned, I, I believe, have to be addressed. Ken, do you want to go over your own business? Well, no, I, I just don't. Um, on what Mr. Arbery just spoke of, I think uh, Mr. Carlin here is going to address an old business. The question that Mr. Schmidt had. That would probably come under old business. You said you were going to speak speak about the uh, the council seat. Correct. Yeah, 
know the general rule business. If the uh, council member that was present, the way was present at last meeting, was not appointed by members of the governing body who serve uh, in the class position as a member of this board, then he could not sit in the capacity and could not vote. And you are correct. The, the, the tonight's minutes should reflect right. that that was uh, improper voting and that his name, or at least it should be corrected in tonight's minutes, reflecting that the prior vote uh, was counted or discounted. We discounted. But that does not affect the approval yeah. because it, it, it's yeah. still a point in yeah. the yeah. vote, so we're just removing that. You are correct. It should be reflected in tonight's minutes. Uh, removing that capacity of that person to vote. When the council member is absent, uh, the alternate sits in that place. Okay, thank you. And I guess I was here at last meeting also on that issue that dealt with defense. Uh, and I believe it's, it's uh, my opinion from what I heard, from the facts that were presented at the last meeting, the zoning officer has already made a ruling and okay. determination. So what it comes down to now is the enforcement of that because the zoning officer's opinion was never appealed to this board. So in a sense, that zoning officer's decision stands. Okay. All right. Thank you. Make a motion to accept the uh, amended minutes on the office. Right? Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 The ayes have it. And the minutes of January 13th are now entered into the record. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a minor subdivision on Block 78. Uh, John D. Burkowski, 93 Reed Avenue. Are the professionals uh, available for comment on that at this time? Uh, I've had an opportunity to review what's been presented uh, to me, the application. Uh, it's uh, drawn in the nature of a minor uh, subdivision uh, from uh, the lots. And as long as the, looking at it very quickly, that the applicant's prepared to testify under the statute of the minor subdivision, it's handled a little bit different than a major application uh, as far as public notice and those kind of things go, unless this board procedurally requires it. But I guess what is uh, important for the engineer to review it to make sure that you're not requiring any variances, because I don't see that as part of the application, uh, by way of front yard, by way of side yard setbacks, uh, as long as it's in conformity with the ordinance requirements, uh, it appears on its face to be in uh, Okay. I've had a chance to review a little bit of it and uh, just now reviewing the plan. Uh, they do have a few variances that are existing. Um, actually, one that is existing. The other two that they were questioning on the, uh, on the plan are not existing because they actually perform the sort of front yard setback and the uh, this, this zone requires that at least half of the houses be set back an equivalent distance from the road. And in this case, this these two houses actually conform with the surrounding homes. Okay. Should I, uh, at this point, ask the applicant to present the case? Uh, I, I would imagine the applicant could come forward, uh, but I'm a little, need some clarification on the variances yeah, that might be necessary. Yeah. Um, so those two variances are not needed. Uh, they have requested a rear yard variance for a shed. Um, the, bar the ordinance requires a five foot setback from the rear yard for private detached garages or accessory buildings. And the existing shed is 2.4 feet. Um, All right, do you have a question, Mr. Roberto, on this application? No, I do not. We have not, we have not had a chance to prepare a letter. Um, so I ask Mr. Harlan here in this interpretation whether an existing variance needs to be noticed. Well, I just been handed a uh, copy of the notice for uh, hearing that's been put in, in the newspaper. And it just indicates that they're seeking an application for a minor subdivision of the lots referencing a copy of the plan. Once an application or an applicant puts a form of notice in, uh, it becomes the obligation of the applicant to tell all the residents that he or she is noticing the full nature of the application, uh, including whatever variances are being requested. Uh, when an application comes in to reset the lines, how it affects the existing structures on there is up to the board to make a determination. Uh, the policy should be that the applicant notices uh, the individuals what variance 
variances are need to be confirmed, even though they're pre-existing, or what variances have to be added to it, such as uh, a need for a side guard variance, or, or whatever the reason for the subdivision, if they're going to put another structure on the lot, how that, sub, that new structure is going to affect side guard setbacks. Um, I, I would give the opinion that the uh, application and plan uh, should have been submitted in time for review by the engineer, and those questions should have been answered before the application goes forward. Because you really don't know what's happening here other than a reset of the lines. I I have to work with Uncle. We have Brian and John reviewing it to give us a bunch of list on it and what variances are are you know already there and what additional variances are needed. I don't I don't feel that I'm prepared to go to this whatsoever. There's nothing in my possession to our reference to. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could we, could we do at least have the applicant yeah, be informally? I'd like to hear the applicants. Explain it so we can help the law. Would you please? Sure. Could you speak in that microphone right there? Have to identify, your, identify yourself and uh, your address also. Thank you. I'm John Limerkowski, uh, 93 North Street Ave. Um, we want to buy a piece of the land that's next to us uh, solely to park the motor home to. There's no intent to build anything. There's no intent to put a whole barn as whatever in the garage. It's just solely to park uh, the motorhome that I uh, own uh, to there. We did uh, hand out within the uh, town um, around us. Everybody who knows exactly what is um, being done, I hand them out. I send out certified letters that we obtained from the township. So we have all those here, and um, it's just basically to parking motor home. There's no intent to build anything. Um, we had the survey out there and you know he did the uh, he talked about the uh, the setback and all the you know the, uh, the distance between the uh, curb and uh, he felt that it was you know pretty plain and simple as far as just buying a piece of land. Um, there's no intent to put anything there, just park the motor home. So we did notify everybody, we got the certifications and everything and um, the only the only question that I visited the site, mm -hmm. and the, the home was already there with the trailer attached, mm -hmm. and, but I didn't go on your property. Mm -hmm. All I did was walk up and down in the yeah. yard, mm -hmm. and that's exactly as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. The only question I had was that, it says you're, you're parking over your home in a trailer, but somewhere on here it says there's the size of the structure. There's not going to be a structure, is there? No, unless there was a mistake, there's definitely not a structure. That's just a, just a it space. Might be, you know, yeah, there's no intent to put anything there. It stays 20 foot by 100 foot. And it says, for size of new structure, it stays 20 foot by 100 foot. That was just because it's just on page two. Yeah, no, it must have been That's the just the size of the land. The size of the land. Okay. okay. It says new structure. It's yeah. probably where we're yeah. getting yeah. caught yeah. up. And, and, and my suspicions are true, Mr. Rubikowski, that the engineering firm did not get the application and time to review it. And of course, Mr. Carter was just handed it in front of you, as you said. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, we got everything from the uh, lady at the uh, office, and we went through page by page. So if there's something that wasn't given out, it wasn't in that packet. So if we didn't mail something out or somebody didn't get something, it wasn't in the packet that we got. So we'll be glad to, you know, resend it out. But, I mean, we'll, we'll well, it, it, Yes, Case in point, you probably would have gotten uh, this evening, you would have heard from the engineer right. about what you needed to perfect your application. Right now, we didn't get right. that not being the case, <laughs> and you know, they, like I said, they didn't have enough because we have to accept the application as final right. and ask the, anybody who wants to cross examine you with your. Right. But at this point, it doesn't look like uh, the application is. Perfected. Do, do you have, uh, you say you sent out notices to everyone with it that you want to keep? Mm -hmm. Do you have with you the white postal receipt? Or He's got the proof of service. Yeah. I got the postal service is all here. Okay. And then we have the uh, hand delivered seat, uh, people who uh, answered the door. I mean, I went door to door and explained to them exactly what we were doing. Some of them said, I don't care what you do, and some of them were concerned about it. <coughs> Your notice at, uh, discloses that nice meeting night. Big time and place. Yes, okay. uh, and I 
guess the reason I ask that uh, is, is the board can make this determination if it chooses. If, they, if I'm hearing the board correctly that you're intending to perhaps move this to another, another meeting night next, next month or whatever. Uh, if the statute does permit you, since the applicant is here, if the applicant provided sufficient notice under, under the uh, statute, uh, the applicant can be waived the requirement of providing that notice a second time. The only thing that I, I would think might be more appropriate uh, is that the uh, applicant at least put a notice in the newspaper again, because I don't think the notice in the newspaper was placed in the it was a right. uh, So that might be a uh, requirement. But if you <coughs> that uh, they do not want to put the burden on the applicant to notice everyone within 200 feet, you can waive that notice. The statute says on a minor subdivision, notice can be a requirement of notice can be an exception. Unless your ordinance requires them to do that, they do not have to have a public notice advertisement uh, on a minor subdivision if there are no variances. Uh, and so if, if there aren't any variances other than the pre-existing, you might extend that to this applicant if you desire to. Well, I, I guess the next question would be if there's anyone from the public we'd like to of course, examine Mr. Lubrikowski. Can we accept that testimony this evening? Well, I would recommend that if you're going to move the hearing to another night, that you just announce it tonight, and anyone that has received the notices would be here if they had an interest in it uh, for objection or support. They would be here. So you can announce when you're going to hear this application okay. and not put the burden on the applicant to notice everyone uh, a second time around. Would, would you? We, we did put it in the record brief, and then I did verbally tell them, like, you know, if you have a problem with it, you're more welcome to show up and whatever. So I mean, the notifications for the 200 feet and inside the paper was were very well um, ahead of time that if somebody had wanted to come here and argue. Well, the, that request has to come from here, Mr. Lubikowski. You, right. you have to grant us, or you have to request from the board an extension until the March meeting or April meeting, whatever is comfortable for you. So if I understand the engineer correctly, there aren't any new variance is being created by this. Nothing is arising from the uh, uh, the surface that is going to park this uh, trailer on as far as uh, coverage or any of that. Correct. And, uh, there's nothing in your ordinance that prohibits the parking of trailers and, and, uh, and that close to the property line. And there's nothing being created. There's nothing that requires the applicant to give additional notice. Of what's well, the, the trailer is ancillary to the motor home use. <laughs> He, he can't do what he wants to do with the motorhome if he can't take the trailer. Yeah, I mean, the trailer and the motorhome, I mean, you know, if, it, if the trailer's a big deal, then, you know, whatever, but I mean, it's the track, it's the motorhome trail. You know, I, uh, we travel and, you know, my son races well on the road 40 weeks, so I need it there. That's what I need. So, with that, uh, what date, would, you know, we meet the second Tuesday, uh, second Wednesday of every month. Okay. So, if you'd like to defer until the Second Wednesday of March, of, of, uh, what, March or April. Sure. March and you have that Santos application. We can do it. Pardon? We can do it. We can't. Before time shifts. Yeah. And uh, we'll put your first on it again. Okay. Is there All right. Or? No, I, I think the uh, you request the board to extend the curries in the sense of, of waiving any further notice. So the board can announce tonight that the, this application will be heard on the second Wednesday in March, uh, same time, same place. Uh, and so that, in effect, is notice pursuant to the statute, because he has problems. But you have to hand in your white cards to the green cards to get that. I think the motion would grant uh, the applicant the courtesy of not needing to uh, re-notice, and anyone in the public that is to uh, speak on this matter has been duly noted that it will be uh, tabled until our next meeting, which is the second. Wednesday of March, 7 o'clock. Favor second? Second, second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Thank you, the uh, ayes have it, and uh, thank you, Mr. Lubikowski, for granting us the extension. Very good. Thank you. And I apologize, but I knew it was going to be a problem because the fact that we didn't have a solicitor and the engineer didn't really get <laughs> enough advance notice. But again, thank you. Very good. Right. I'll see you next month. Thank you.
I have a question I have to ask the secretary, but take care of the received and filed with their application. Yeah. Does it require a response from the solicitor? Yeah, we usually Okay, move the communication be received and filed. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Communication <laughs> received and filed. And we have the two letters to be ready. Yeah, another communication from John uh, El Sordo regarding John DePiro and that I'll have to get the end. Regarding uh, that uh, until he pays up his fees and stuff, uh, he wouldn't get an approval on the property or subdivision he's doing. Absolutely. Okay, let me do that. The next thing was from Zane and the zoo. Uh, was just a notice that they revised their affidavit of service for um, the land approvals group, which will be coming in on the 14th, St. Louis's property. Yeah, when the people kind of said they were, they were on the list. Of well, the members. park did uh, a revised notice oh, okay. for those people on Davis, but this is from his office that he did a revised notice also. Okay, so they're really acting under auspices of the law when they give you an affidavit of service. Right. And we have another... Uh, Taylor, Wiseman, and Taylor. It was actually addressed to John Pettit, and they had some recommendations on it regarding cedar properties. They're the pad sites. So they're which is the, the plain... Over here to the plain site, right? Right. Okay. Okay. Do you want to look at that? Or? Good communication to receive the file. Mr. Chairman, before we take that motion, I'd like to make a motion first. Communication from Mr. Del Sordo to the copy went. Did we get the copy to the former solicitor? Okay. So moved. Uh, is that it? That's it. This, ma this portion of the meeting is open to good and welfare. Anyone who wishes to speak, please come to the front of the room here. Give us your name and address. You can speak on any matter. Hi, Colleen Kerr, 840 West Ave. I'm actually here. I was asked to come tonight um, as a representative of the school board um, with concerns. I haven't been to any of these meetings, so I'm not sure what's going on um, behind Park Farms, talking about building low income housing. I just wonder if I can get some information. Is that going to happen? Is it the past? It's in its infant states right now. We haven't heard the case yet, but there is an application for 18.1 acre development back there. And uh, it's uh, still pending in front of the board. We did not have the solicitor at the January meeting, and I know no one's going to be. They sent us a letter requesting a delay to watch the 14th on your application. And does it specify? I mean, are we looking like at so many homes, apartments, condos? Do you know? Nothing's been approved. Nothing has been approved. I know approved. nothing's been approved, but do they have to put what their intention is for that piece of property? 
or they don't well, have the, the uh, property is owned R3, which is R3 lots of the borough running me require 80 foot front, 100 foot deep, 8,000 square feet. Also along with that application, they're talking about a mixture of R3 homes and townhouses. And that has not been settled. Okay. That issue is still, could be settled here at a public meeting and when the board will vote on the, on the findings of that meeting. And then March 14th or we don't have a, a formal application. They're only asking for a concept plan Right? at the present time, if they get their concept plan and it's approved, then I expect we're going to see a lot of activity here on the board on a formal application with development of the entire site. Be aware of the fact that there are wetlands prevalent, present on that site, not prevalent, present. That was a wrong statement. So, going to be uh, an interesting one and I'm sure it's going to generate a lot of public interest. But we'd be interested in hearing your comment at the meeting. Second to say it. Very much. Well, everybody at the meeting has, has a chance to cross-examine her. Right. All the professionals. But uh, there is someone going around town and uh, I can't speak to it because it, it didn't knock on my door. Not well, I understand there's someone going around town <laughs> saying that, that uh, we're going to have a low-income housing project. Okay. That's the furthest thing from our mind. Okay. Right? All right. We, when, we, when that land became available for a redistribution or a redesignation of use, we improved, improved the use of the land to an R3, which is Every, most all towns in the borough running these all houses are on 40, 50, or 60 foot lots. Right. 60 foot lot is the norm now for R1 development. Okay. R2 developments are the ones back on uh, Davis. Davis. Yeah, David, on Davis Avenue, okay. the ones that dead end into the, the other end. Of, right. So they're 20,000 square feet, right, with a 100 foot front, okay? Because R1, we, we went to R2 and said, well, if we can get a housing development here, why don't we try and upgrade a little bit so it doesn't look like you made a side step or a downgrade. So at that point, and I was on the planning board when this happened, okay. I think it goes back to 1994. He said, well, it looks like you have enough land here to do another uh, residential development. And that's when we go up with the 8,000 square feet. That's what it is right now, Colleen. All right. So, okay. I hope I answered your questions. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else? Another date on my calendar. Let's see what you guys say. Mm -hmm. Good evening. John Schmidt, I'm having a good Let me begin. begin. Um, I don't know the board member's name sitting all the way to the far right, or my right, your left. Uh, thank you for bringing that point up uh, regarding what I said, which was not included in the minutes. Um, and if I could ask, before you spoke, Mayor, sorry, to make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. Um, having already been sent a letter by the borough solicitor saying it was improper, Mayor, why would you make a motion to approve what was in front of you? Did you read the minutes before making that motion? Refer to the solicitor on that, would you please? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I understand the nature of your question, but I think the uh, fact that it's on the record speaks for itself. Uh, the issue was moved to get it on the floor. That's not improper to do that, to make a motion to get it on the floor. Once their motion is moved and seconded, then it's up for discussion. And discussion results in a change and variation, which it did, then that action can be adjust adjusted, and then the motion is carried. Okay. Well, I'm glad that the minutes will reflect uh, my comments, and hopefully also reflect uh, what the mayor stated about having the authority to do, do what uh, she did with the appointments. 
Um, I guess my next question, I know you have minute, minutes from January. Um, the amendment minutes that you have to do from December. Uh, do you have a time frame on that? Or will they be reprepared to be submitted in March? As Mr. White was appointed as the alternate class three member by the mayor. Did you, did you approve the minutes from December? The last, last meeting I'm trying to get, so are you saying that that should be changed? Well, Mr. White is listed as voting. Okay. So what you can do at the end of the public portion, if any board member wants to make a motion that the December minutes be corrected in accordance with what correction is done to you. Um, I guess I'll continue down this. The amended path, um, February 9th, 2011, Friends and Planning and Zoning Ordinance. Um, there was one vote that was um, nine days, one abstention. Um, under old business, there was a resolution approving crowd, uh, crowd barriers, uh, seven days, three abstentions. I As you are aware, as I was informed by the clerk, uh, Mr. Al Rhodes was formerly the alternate member uh, of the Planning and Zoning Board. In this particular meeting, we had 10 people voting, um, 10 members of the board, but the alternate doesn't vote unless a member of any class is not there. He was voting, we had 10 members voting, which I do not believe is permissible. If I'm wrong with that, the solicitor can correct me, but I believe they would also have to be amended. Additionally, under March 9th, 2011, under, there was a resolution regulating the sal salary of the secretary to the board. Uh, Mr. Rhodes voted. Resolution memorializing Gardner Real Estate Company, LLC. Mr. Rhodes voted. Resolution memorializing alley application. Mr. Rhodes voted. Um, there was a discussion regarding um, An application by Mr. Joseph DiStralo, 432 West Clemens Bridge Road. Um, that was the 6 to 2 vote with Mr. Rhodes voting. I believe it should be 5 to 2, as the class 1 and class 2 um, would not have participated in that and were excused. There was a um, subdivision vote uh, for 432 West Clemens Bridge, I believe. That was a 10 0 vote. Them as well. Um, I'm not sure the proper way to proceed on those, whether it be in this meeting or at a future meeting, but I believe they should also be redundant. Mr. Rhodes had no legal standing to vote. Well, I, I guess the only, the only comment I would make to the board, uh, not being a solicitor, is that the facts and circumstances. But I think what you're asking is that the board turn the clock back to last year uh, and take some action to amend minutes that had been approved and sitting in their record files for a year. Uh, and, uh, and you're asking that they be amended because of the nature of votes that perhaps an alternate was called to vote when the alternate was not seated. Uh, if that's what you're saying. The alternate was a member of the board. But, but what I didn't see that at that hearing or at that issue or that <coughs> evening, the vote in the place of an absent regular member. Right. Everyone was present, right. the nine regular members plus the alternate. Right, and the alternate voted. Right, which he should have. So you're asking that the, the board go back to its minutes a year ago to make that correction? That's, yes. I, I would have to tell the board that that's probably not necessary, that you uh, go back into all your minutes the uh, action that took place then should stand for itself. The only reason I, uh, I uh, thought it was very appropriate to make that motion tonight on what took place at last meeting was you're now approving those minutes and you're addressing that. And even December, because it was all tied into the same issue. But I think to roll the clock back and say, we're gonna go back to our minutes in February mm -hmm. 2011 and make changes I would advise the board against doing that. Okay. Well, minutes, Mr. Oakley wasn't privy to a conversation that I had with the vice chair. We were going to take care of that under new under old business with this month's meeting. Yeah. What happened last month? Right. Yeah, because yeah. because the uh, well, it was inconsequential. We had to respond to Joe's yeah. request, and it was a valid and uh, and accurate request. And I honestly, I mean, I. 
I, I agree with, with what mm -hmm. Mr. Schmitz uh, what he had to say, and having said that, all of the votes were inconsequential, so I believe right. I rolled the clock back a year, you know, for the sake of... But clarify for the record, yeah. 10 members should never vote, correct? The alternate should not vote when every member of the class is present. present. Are, are you, are, are you in, intimating that any one of the votes would have changed the outcome? Yeah, the only one that was that would have, I don't know, I think would have passed anyway. I don't think it, so I think sometimes we, then, so that would, be would, be six to, would be six to five to two, but I don't think that. Then I'd have to divert to the advice yeah, of our attorney. All, all I'm asking is that the, the, the alternate member only votes in the absence of a member of any And we've taken care of that. We're going to do that. When we sit down, the next time we have any vote, I'm going to have the official announce who is eligible to vote at that time. And then you won't have anything to write about. Well, I don't write about it. I take people to court and hold people accountable. You do? Yes, I do. Then, then we'll, that will be very sure to make sure that will happen. Um, finally, my last question going back to last month, maybe won't be answered or not, but the mayor stated that she had the authority to do so, and Mr. Chairman, you supported the mayor in that. Can I ask why? Do so about him. Sure. You, you had you had the mayor said she had the authority, and you supported the mayor saying she had the authority. Why? I think that's an I'm not going to answer the question. From what I understand, is that I was acting solicitor at that, so I did not know all the facts. But after that meeting, I spoke to Mr. Del Soto, and I spoke to Mr. Kennedy to get some background as to circumstances. And the way it was explained to me is that it was a misunderstanding as to what capacity that person, that uh, council member, was sitting in. That was not intended to be a participant in a vote. That the council member can sit there as a liaison. Is that inappropriate in and of itself? I would probably not recommend that, that a board do that because it creates a misinterpretation of what that person is sitting on. Uh, so if a council member is absent, it's the alternate that sits in. But to, and I think that explanation was given by Mr. Del Soro and Mr. Kennedy when we had our conversations about what took place. I think the, Mr. Kennedy put out his a uh, memo uh, to the members of council and the board members are aware that that action and how to go forward. So to ask a question as to why they voted, I'm going to tell you from what my understanding from speaking to the two solicitors, it was a misunderstanding of the opinion given by Mr. Del Sordo as to what capacity that council member was present. And I think that should stand for the record. Okay, so Mr. Del Sordo gave wrong advice for now. I didn't say he gave wrong advice. I get, I, what I'm saying is the way he gave his opinion was misunderstood. Okay. Finally, uh, I, I guess questions like this, you have a solicitor for a reason, but you have a chairman to run the meetings, and you're expected to know basic joint land use laws. Uh, Mr. Chairman, how long have you been chairman of this board? Uh, about 14 months. 14 months. And how long have you been a member? That's none of your business. How, it is a, it's a public many record. Years. You want to go back as many years as you've been alive. Okay. You should have known better, sir. With all due respect. I am not a lawyer, sir, and I will not answer any more of your questions because I'm afraid I'm intimidated over a lawsuit. Well, I think that everyone, when you take a job, you should know Chapter 101 of how your board is set up. You got okay? to use Chapter 101, right? I'm using that as an example. Chapter 101. Good. How's the board set up? That's the most basic thing. That should never go on a stray. And it happened under your watch, sir. And I think you should take a step back and think about it, okay? And, and consider stepping and consider stepping down and letting someone else take the job who's going to know what's going on. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. I, I make a comment. I, I think the chairman uh, answered your question. Uh, speaking personally, and I, and I believe I spoke for most members of the board, we have nothing but the highest respect for our chairman. We, we understand what the job he has to do, and we thank you very much for your comments. 
I never seen anything like it. I spoke to a lot of officials, past and present, planning, zoning, uh, committee, commissioners, uh, council people, mayors. None of them ever heard of anything like this happening before. So I'm glad that uh, you know Mr. Carlin understands it. I'm glad that it won't happen again. But it shouldn't have happened. I can't promise it won't happen again. Thank you. I think no one else willing to speak. I can move the uh, public portion of the meeting to close. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Public portion of the meeting is now closed. Having no other business to come in front of the board. Brian, do you have anything? I have nothing, sir. I have nothing. I move that we adjourn. Second. That was great. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. The meeting is now adjourned at uh, yeah. 7.15.